and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 279, recorded on February 7th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. This past week saw the annual Fosdom get-together, with numerous talks and community events. We've been digging through the presentations as they go online, and a couple of them have caught our attention. Yeah, it seems, at least from afar, that Fosdom 2023 was a big, healthy, successful event. Maybe back to the way things were, it was still hybrid as well, so it was available to stream inside of Matrix itself. And uh, I, in particular, speaking of Matrix, noticed that uh, Matthew Hodgson, the one of the Matrix OGs, had a presentation that was titled Matrix 2.0. Please come in, come in, roll up, roll up for the Matrix show. Or introducing Matrix 2.0 or how we are going to make or how we have made Matrix go voom. Matthew gave a quick rundown of some of the recent advances in Matrix and the supporting software in the ecosystem. But if you're not familiar with Matrix yet, well, don't worry. Matthew has a pretty quick little elevator pitch. You can use it for interoperable chat, so following along on Fosdome, bridge through to IRC or XMPP, etc., you could use it for interoperable VoIP. But Matrix at its core is a real-time communication fabric for any kind of real-time comms. So you could use it for communication within VR or AR. You could use it to synchronize world data within VR and AR. You could use it for IoT. It is basically meant to be the missing communication layer of the open web. But what we were listening for was this whole making Matrix go vroom business. Matthew outlined several server-side improvements, uh, protocol improvements, VoIP improvements, element improvements, really a whole bunch of stuff all coming together. Like This is fundamentally changing how Federation works, how VoIP works, and critically, how servers sync data to clients and how you log in. Couldn't be a bigger change, so we are... Um, taking the liberty of declaring it Matrix 2.0 when we finally release it. So this does, is not a breaking change. This is pure enthusiasm, basically on my behalf, because I think it's worth saying, hey guys, come back to Matrix, give it another go, because we fixed all the crap stuff and we're calling it Matrix 2.0. And looking out even further, well, work is progressing on a fully peer-to-peer -peer server setup for Matrix. Matrix is way too dependent on servers and the admins and the risks of internet shutdowns and censorship. This is because home servers have to store their users' chat history and metadata. Peer-to-peer -peer Matrix exists to fix this. This is a long-running um, sort of blue sky project, so to speak, um, where we go and embed your home server inside the app in order to not have a server running in the cloud. And um, Dendrite is the server we use. Big news on Dendrite is as of a few weeks ago, it passes 100% server API compliance. So it has parity with good old Synapse. And 93% client server API and the 7% is boring stuff we don't really care about for this. That would really be an exciting development. And that's also, Dendrite's another one of their servers. So if you're not totally familiar, you've got Synapse and then you've got Dendrite. And then Matthew does wrap it all up with one kind of sobering point that we wanted to make note of here on the show. The Matrix Project has been going out of their way to state over and over again, they really need our support. And finally, we need help. Friends don't let friends use proprietary chat services. Please use Matrix, and critically, and this is new and it's really important, if you're benefiting commercially from Matrix, please financially support the foundation. Because it, we're it's stuck in this horrible feedback loop at the moment where the better we make Matrix, uh, the less inclined it seems that people want to like, pay for support or pay for things if they can just grab it on GitHub. This can end up being a disaster where we run out of cash. So please, please, please contribute back, particularly if you're a government. You've got loads of money. Um, also, run a server, run British Parts, build on Matrix, follow us on Mastodon. Sticking with Fosdom just a bit longer, one of the latest Fedora remixes was introduced to the public at the event. That's Fedora Asahi. Yeah, uh, it's a remix of Fedora that carries the latest upstream patches to get Fedora running on Apple's M1 hardware. And right now, there's a special interest group, and their mission is to get Fedora to a usable enough state for developers and other interested parties to work on it and get things 
over the finish line. The remix is carrying patched versions of the Linux kernel, Mesa, and a few other related bits that work to enable Fedora on the Apple M systems. Fedora Asahi is also carrying the early Linux kernel support for Rust drivers we've mentioned before, as well as building that kernel with LLVM. Now, we took a sneak peek at Fedora Asahi just over a week ago, as we saw the bits landing. It's certainly still early days, but I think we were both surprised by how smoothly the installation went, and just how well all those patched pieces of software have been integrated into Fedora. I mean, Asahi Linux itself is based on Arch Linux, so there, there are some differences to be considered. If you're curious, you can check out Linux Unplugged 496 for that. Yeah, it's definitely in a usable enough state for developers to work on it, enthusiasts to bang away at it, or for those that are just so desperate to get Linux on their M hardware, like maybe me, uh, it's, it's good enough. And you maybe don't get the best battery life. You don't get necessarily all aspects of your hardware. Maybe the speakers aren't working yet, stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's really kind of pretty great to see it as far as it is. I was very impressed. I, I came in kind of expecting it to be a little more broken than it was and walked away feeling very optimistic about the long-term potential of getting a fully accelerated Linux desktop experience on that hardware. I think it's going to happen now. And this uh, remix of Fedora integrates those upstream Asahi improvements really well. And I think you got to give credit to the Asahi project for just really following their principles about upstreaming as much code as they can. And the Fedora project has been able to incorporate that, and they've done a great job. And it makes Fedora super accessible um, to uh, people that have the M-series hardware. Other distros are starting to do this, right? Kali Linux is working on M1 support as well. Uh, you'll see other distros do this, and eventually... This remix, the goal is to be folded back into just upstream Fedora. And so at some point down the road, you would just go grab the standard Fedora ISO and that would just load and install on a M1 device like it was just a regular computer. <laughs> and you won't have to grab a particular remix ISO at that point. There is one other presentation we wanted to direct your attention to. It's the podcasting 2.0. It's all about interoperability talk. They show how the Podcasting 2.0 community is reinventing podcasting by adding many new features while keeping all of it interoperable. What I liked about the talk itself, actually, is that uh, it's from the perspective of a developer who is an open source enthusiast. They create a really awesome open source platform for podcasters and just a podcast lover themselves. Why talking about podcasting here at FOSDEM? Because podcasting will save the open internet. Link in the notes. For that. After you wrap up this episode, I'm sure you're off to update your Meth TV box, since version 33 came out this week. You know, Wes, there would have been a time. I definitely was an enthusiastic Myth TV user back in the day. Um, but it's been about a year since Myth TV 32 came out, so this weekend marked the release of Myth TV 33. And yeah. This is a nearly 21-year-old open-source digital video recorder project, and it's still going strong. I think it's, uh, I think their anniversary is like next month or something like that. It's coming up really soon. Uh, with Myth TV 33, I think the most notable new thing is they have a web interface now that's being developed for the Myth TV setup experience. But, you know, we really just wanted to note the occasion here because it's, it's just great to see a long-lived project still being developed and still hitting milestones. There have been some nice UI improvements, and they pulled in the latest FFmpeg, always important. Plus, of course, as always, a whole lot of code modernization and restructuring to keep improving the Myth TV code base, something that's especially important for a long-lived project. Downloads and more details can be found in our show notes. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and it's a great way to support the show while you are checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Real humans all day, every day. You got something going on on a holiday? They got humans there. It's like part of their secret sauce because they've been at this for a long time, and they had to build a business on its merits, something that was competitive, not with a bunch of crazy funding. They had to build it on the back of the product. And as a result, they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers out there that want to lock into their crazy platforms. And they have the best performance. 
Today, they've got 11 data centers, but they've got even more coming online throughout this year. Great features such like S3 object storage, which uh, I am consistently finding new uses for. Cloud firewalls to prevent the traffic from ever even hitting your rig. Backups that are easy to understand and transparent. Kubernetes support, Terraform, and a lot more. And if you're already a Linode user and you want to check out new Linode features, they have the Linode Greenlight program. I'll put a link in the show notes. You can sign up for upcoming betas for like new data centers that are coming online, enhancements to the object storage, new compute functions. They have a bunch of neat stuff. So if you're like a Linode pro, you might want to join the Greenlight. It could be kind of cool, right? Get on the inside. I love Linode. You can tell I'm really enthusiastic about it. And I think you're going to like it. It's what we use for everything. I trust it with my business. I trust it with my family stuff. Super reliable, fast, and great support. Go get that $100, put it over the top, build something, try something. Maybe it's a great opportunity to learn something. Linode.com slash LAN. That's Linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Our sponsor, Collide, has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? Well, if a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in Zero Trust architecture, and that's device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems, like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are locking into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication. And it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash LAN to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. One more Fedora story while we're on a roll. This week, we can report that the seas have been parted. The steps of Mount Sulea have been climbed. And the Fedora project has completed a multi-year-long effort to remove their own FlatHub filter in GNOME software. If you didn't know, starting with Fedora 35, when you enabled FlatHub support in GNOME software, the remote list, well, it had been filtered with an allow list that only makes a limited subset of FlatHub software available to Fedora users. For your protection, of course. At the end of January, the Fedora Engineering and Steering Committee, or FESCO, finally signed off on the proposed unfiltered flat hub change. Ah, and with this change now approved, starting in Fedora 38, you will be able to search and install and enjoy all the flat hub software, complete and unfiltered. Obviously, I wish this had happened sooner, um, because I was a very consistent Fedora user for a while, and then took a break, started trying other things based on some policy decisions the project had made, but wanted to come back a little while ago and get another Fedora box set up again. And I was getting pretty excited. You know, it's a good, clean desktop and I'm ready to get right down to work. So I fire up GNOME software and I, I search for some very common software and uh, no results. Oh, that's weird, I think. So I go double check. Yep, FlatHub's turned on. Okay, great. I'll go over to FlatHub and I search for the software in FlatHub. Oh, yeah, there it is. So I copy the install command, paste it on the terminal. Can't be found. What? What do you mean? Yeah, I just saw it on FlatHub. What do you mean it can't be found? No, nope, it can't be found. I'm not getting an error message telling me that it's filtered. I'm not getting a message that tells me your distribution maker has arbitrarily decided to not allow certain applications because we're scared of our legal department. There's no message that comes up and tells you that. So you're just left to just sort of be gaslit by the operating system that the software doesn't exist. And then once you figure out there's a filter in place and you figure out how to replace that and get rid of it, then you can proceed. But only until you get to that point do you actually get the software you want. And in fact, it's even worse than that because in some cases, it'll instead return a search result that is just a web link that it installs and it creates a .desktop file that just launches your web browser and takes you to the website of the application you were trying to install. 
And sometimes it doesn't come up when you search for it. <laughs> it's the most wild, lousy user experience I've ever seen in software, for you know, in a software install center. I mean, it's really quite awful. And I also felt like it was sort of the opposite of the goals of Flatpak and Flathub. And ironically, those are projects that are very close to Fedora. And here was Fedora kind of perverting what gets delivered to the end user. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that this took a little bit longer than many of us would have liked. But it's still great to see it happening. And it's one more thing that we get to look forward to in Fedora 38, which seems to be shaping up to be a pretty banger release. All things going to plan, that should ship sometime mid to late April. Yeah, along with GNOME 44, hopefully. We'll be keeping an eye on that and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss a single episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. And you can celebrate Coder Radio 500 in style for a limited time while supplies last. The Coder Robe is back, along with a new Coder Tumblr and a brand new Coder Radio sticker, all over at jupitergarage.com. As for us, well, we'll be back next week in our robes with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week. <laughs>